All right, so this is uh, part three of this topic, uh, Forged in Fire. And I uh, just want to remind you of this is the big picture. Uh, we're talking about faith and how it goes through different cycles of uh, deconstruction and reconstruction using a key verse out of 1 Peter 1, 7 that says our faith uh, is often refined in uh, the the troubles uh, of life and uh, and it comes out pure as a result of that. Talk a little bit about stages that we go through from simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony. And then a disclaimer is uh, deconstruction is something that happens in the course of uh, our walk with God, and we make adjustments along the way. And we reconstruct, and that's why I put this kind of uh, cycle together from simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony. And uh, I think we go through this multiple times. And we're going to illustrate today a little bit. Uh, last week, we looked at some examples. Uh, but today, we're going to talk a little bit of how it's reflected even in how the Bible deconstructs itself. Um, we're going to use a couple of passages of scripture to show how uh, Paul, in his use of a, the stories that are in the Old Testament, uh, kind of changes some things up and adapts it to his purpose. So uh, we'll be looking at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in a few moments. We uh, talked just a little bit last week about a guy by the name of Jacques Derrida, a French philosopher that really kind of coined the term deconstruction. And what he was talking about is the use of words um, often deconstruct in and of themselves by change of meaning or change of context, that type of thing. And words always imply something beyond the initial writing and uh, reading of the text. And I think that's what we're going to see tonight when we take a look at how Paul uses the Old Testament text. Sometimes I think when we think that words are used, that they are stable entities. Uh, but we know that by the redefinition of words, thus also by the Bible, that it has different meanings in different uh, contexts and different generations. So when we talk about truth, and we kind of think of truth kind of in, in static terms. Um, we often don't relate it to the uh, bigger picture, which is the cultural conceptions uh, that are often read into the text. Now, that's not a bad thing because that's what keeps the scriptures living. And you can see down at the bottom of the screen there that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it reminds us that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword cutting to the marrow. And the idea behind that is each generation kind of encounters the text in a new way. And what we find is we get to the root of the original meaning of a text, but then we have to relate it to our own day and age. And that's where uh, deconstruction comes in because our context, our uh, culture is something that is completely different than when it was originally written. Sometimes people have issues with that um, because they think that if we can keep kind of a static definition of written material, then it's easy to know what truth is. Um, but what words mean have something more to do than just the grammar of it. It also has experience and tradition that's also connected to it as well. Then there's the other factor that when we read anything, I don't care if it's reading the scriptures or reading the newspaper, uh, we read into what we're reading uh, because it requires interpretation. And that's why there's always debate about especially technical material. Um, you know, we'll hear a lot about uh, the Constitution of the United States next year as we head into another election year. And what's meant and what's not meant is up for debate because words have different 
shades of meaning and angles to that. And so uh, the U.S. Constitution, in a sense, could go through some deconstruction um, if if we take seriously um, our own context. And what I mean by that is many people next year will be appealing to the Second Amendment that I have the right to bear arms. But then you have to define, are you a well organized militia, that's also in the text. Uh, and then you have to uh, understand context. Would the writers of the US Constitution have written it the same way, knowing that there is um, a war type weaponry that people can buy off the streets in the day in which it was written, that wasn't the case. So you're gonna hear a lot of debate about that. I bet that'll come up at every debate that's on TV. And I haven't really watched the current Republican debates all that closely, but I imagine it was mentioned several times in the last, I, how many have we had? Three Republican debates already, I think. So anyways, words uh, take different shapes to them depending upon when we live and uh, where we live. So having said that, here's what I want us to do. How is it? that sometimes things deconstruct. Well, not only did Jacques Derrida introduce the word, but it was in process all along. So I don't know if any anyone has heard of a man by the name of René Descartes, another French guy. Um, he lived between 1596 and 1650, but he was kind of the predecessor and really the hinge that began to transition from Middle Age thinking, or it's often sometimes called the Dark Ages, to what is called the Enlightenment. So as he lived, he began to prep uh, uh, for a different way of living and thinking. Uh, and it primarily had to do with scientific uh, invention and revolution and those type of things. So you can see on the screen here, the Enlightenment uh, brought to us a lot of scientific discoveries, and reason began at that point to question a lot of the traditional ideas that had been preserved during the Middle Ages. Some of them obviously were superstitions, but some of them that carried a lot of authority, whether it's a theological concept like purgatory or whether it is um, the meaning of something uh, in terms of uh, writers of scripture, um, uh, traditions that are there versus traditions that are imposed upon it. And, and of course, uh, the Reformation kind of plays into all of this uh, as well. So in, in the Enlightenment, there is this emphasis on empirical observation rather than on what is called metaphysics or spirituality. And Descartes was an individual that was quite devout as a Catholic. And he saw that his society was changing and it was moving more toward intellectualism versus superstition. And he saw a lot of the traditional ideas starting to unravel with these developments. So what he wanted to do was prove the existence of God. And he wanted to use intellectualism to do so. As he accepted that challenge, he began to see that his own way of uh, thinking about truth and the proof of something was unraveling or deconstructing before him because anything that he thought about, he began to doubt. And I'm sure you've heard this phrase. Um, he came up with a very famous uh, phrase, um, and it's, I think, therefore I am. Have any of you heard that phrase before? It, the idea behind it was, you can doubt everything. The one thing I can't doubt is that I'm alive, or I exist, or I think. And so what he realized was that the scientific method could not prove the existence of God. What it could do is give probabilities of a force, a creator, that type of thing. But in terms of actual proof, using the construction 
of the scientific method, God can't be proven. So at that point, what happens is now it, it begins to take place where what we believe has to go beyond the mind. And that's where this idea of a leap of faith sometimes comes into play. And what we believe is far more than what is in our mind. It's also what's in our heart. So the idea behind this is sometimes the way we have thought about something runs up against something that the heart resonates with. Now, by the heart, I don't mean the actual physical organ, but that idea of soul and spirit that understands certain things that the, the mind can't reason out. So part of that is the existence of God. So I can't prove the existence of God, but in my heart or my inner self, I really believe there is a creator. I really believe there's a power. There, there is this divine essence that brought uh, creation and the universe to being. And all of us have those moments where um, we begin to think a little bit differently about something because there's something that is inside of us that doesn't ring true to how we're thinking about a particular topic. So it can be something as great as if God is love, can we really believe in a conscious eternal torment? Is that a definition of love? Or is something in my heart telling me I need to rethink this because uh, the only reason maybe that I believe something is because I've been told that my entire life or by an authority figure of some sort. So there are these elements in us. And I think, um, and I I just love coming back to the illustration uh, that Shelley keeps giving about being open and affirming, that she had an experience that was a part of God communicating in a way beyond the mind. It was something that included the spirit uh, to look at this topic differently or to reassess something in terms of uh, affirmation, acceptance, openness, and love uh, toward the LGBTQ community. So faith is not just something that's a part of the mind. It's also a part of the spirit. It's part of how God's spirit interacts with our spirit. And then it becomes an action that we, uh, we take based upon that. Well, when we go through those changes, what we are doing is deconstructing sometimes some of the things that we've been told and reconstructing another way of thinking about that particular topic. Well, that might not be the only time you do that. You might do that several times, depending upon what the subject matter is. So does that make sense to everybody so far? Are you okay with any questions or comments on that? So faith is an action, not just a belief in a historical fact. So a lot of times, especially in Western Christianity, faith is all about believing in my mind something. And usually that relates, was Jesus born of a virgin? Did he rise from the dead? Now, they're very important things, but there's elements to faith uh, that go beyond just uh, mentally assenting to certain things. So I can uh, give assent to the virgin birth and to the resurrection of Jesus. But as James tells us in his epistle, that's really kind of a dead faith if it doesn't produce action, if it's not something that actually prompts something better and uh, in me and more glorious uh, to God and, and uh, to his community. So faith sometimes requires a leap of faith uh, to be committed to God, even when we have certain um, doubts or, as I put here, rationally uncertain about certain things. I've often wondered what the psalmist really had in mind when he said, oh, taste and see 
that the Lord is good. That's Psalm 34, verse 8. What is he talking about? Is he thinking about certain things? And is that is he equating that to actually taste? Or is it an experience of some sort that affirmed within him that the Lord is good toward not only him, but his people as well? So um, all of that, all those are kind of moving parts, I guess, uh, as we talk about the subject of faith. Any thoughts there? Okay, so in the Middle Ages, so let's back up pre-Enlightenment. In the Middle Ages, it was said that theology is the queen of the sciences. Now, what was meant by that was that theology should reign supreme over other branches of learning. So if the Bible says um, a something, then all of science has to kind of fit into that and under that. So a good example of that is uh, what is called the Copernican Revolution, which uh, Copernicus came up with the idea uh, that the sun was not revolving around the earth as if the earth was the center, but that actually earth was in orbit around the sun. Now, uh, uh, Galileo and Copernicus, uh, they are looking at that through telescopes and science, and they've come up with a different theory than what was being believed by the church. The church condemned them as heretics uh, because they came up with a different way of looking at it. In the Middle Ages, theology always reigned supreme. It didn't matter what other branches of learning discovered. You had to submit to the accepted theology of the church. And of course, that's what got in trouble uh, in, with the church, especially as it led up to the Reformation. But um, this idea of the source of all knowledge uh, was found in theology. And of course, at the centerpiece of theology was the Bible, or at least the interpretation of the Bible as per the papacy, uh, those that were empowered to interpret it properly. So at that point, theology kind of became a cage. It kind of locked God in a cage. This is the way God operates, and this is the only way God can operate. Um, and sometimes that's what happens even post-Reformation. Certain theologies kind of become a cage that God has to operate within these four walls, and he can't operate outside that. Now, if we think about that logically, I think one of the things that we uh, would know is that God is not beholden to any particular theological cage that we want to put him in, that he's bigger than that. In fact, we we as human beings are unable to totally figure God out. So academic theology can try to keep God in a position where I don't feel threatened by something that either I am unfamiliar with or I think uh, is is dangerous in some way. And yet what we find is that faith and uh and experience go together. Now, I find that this beatitude, we're not going to talk about this one this week on Sunday. We'll get to it uh, next week. Uh, but I find this fascinating. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That there's an element to faith that goes beyond just intellectualism. Uh, there are elements of faith that can't be controlled by theological boxes that uh, we are most comfortable with. Uh, God is not limited to our logic, is what I'm trying to say. And it, because of that, we are always understanding that God is revealing more of himself. Um, if we believe that uh, it is true uh, that God still can speak, and still be involved in in humanity, then um, then we need to understand that that will go beyond the pages of scripture 
at times. And really, when you look at the scripture as not a rule book, but a set of experiences told in story form primarily, um, and they're collected together as a library, then what we can do is say, okay, we can learn from these experiences. They, they will give to us uh, signs as to how God moves in different ways, but it doesn't limit God necessarily to that. Does that make sense? Any questions or comments there? Okay. So uh, Blaise Pascal said uh, here, he said, um, the heart has its reasons, which reason does not know. We feel it in a thousand things. It is the heart which feels God and not reason. This then is perfect faith. God felt in the heart. So um, Blaise Pascal was a mathematician. He wrote a marvelous work called Penzies. Uh, and this was part of his writings there. And so you would think, um, if anyone would think that you can think your way to an understanding of God, it would be a prominent mathematician. I mean, you're working with uh, facts and numbers and that type of thing. But he realized that there are things that happen within the heart or experience that um, sometimes reason cannot figure out or understand. So uh, good quote. It's a um, good, uh, good writer as well. All right. Thoughts? We really are going to get to the scripture and uh, it's going to occur here. Um, so we want to introduce another term. Now, this will scare most Protestants. Okay. It's the term mysticism. But what that means, basically, is a person who is open to experiencing God in some way. So it's not the idea of um, mindlessness. It's not the idea of um, going into a trance or anything like that. Um, the traditional idea behind a mystic is someone that realizes that... Uh, religion that is solely dependent upon intellectualism or rationalism um, will often be threatened when there are things that are discovered outside their particular uh, theological or intellectual box. Now, that's what happened with the discoveries that were made uh, by Charles Darwin, the theory of evolution. That really threw the church into kind of a quandary what do we do with this information um there's no we can't we can't go back to the text here and um and find any elements of uh progression and evolution uh so it must not be true there there's that idea again of using the theological box to dismiss things sometimes that are found that are in contradiction. So that can often create a spiritual crisis. Um, and what deconstruction often does is people who realize I can't be satisfied with simplistic answers anymore. I have to look deeper into something and see how these things are harmonized, or at least how these things um are thought about and 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 not be afraid of it because but it, it's almost as if sometimes people are afraid that god can be explained away out of existence but not if you're a mystic while you can't prove intellectually that god exists well how does the uh old uh him go you ask me how i know he lives he lives inside my heart. In other words, th there's something beyond just the mind. It it's the whole experience. So people with experiences are not at the mercy of people with an argument. Now, a lot of times we try to dismiss people's experiences because we're uncomfortable with them. But 
the fact of the matter is if a person um, really had that experience and it's not some uh, side effect of medication or something like that or drugs, uh, that type of thing, then we have to take seriously that I can't discount another person's experience. I'm not in their shoes. And that's hard to do. That's really, really hard to do because I feel safe in certain circles, but I don't feel safe in other circles. And those are the type of things that I think we have talked about before when people sometimes have experienced other religious environments and things have been done that uh, would go, ooh, that gives me the heebie-jeebies, you know, that type of thing. Um, I can... I can either accept the fact that God works in other ways than beyond the way I personally experience God, or I will then say they're wrong. And I, I've got to be careful of that because God doesn't necessarily always work in the same way that he works within me. Okay. So a person with experience is not necessarily at the mercy of a person with an argument. So one of the things that God does in the scripture, I only give two examples here. And this one, this first one, Israel in the wilderness in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. We're going to talk about that text in a second. But this is an experience. I'll go ahead and read it now because we're going to allude to it here in a moment. So in Numbers chapter 13, I want to throw out the question after you hear this of how do you think you would have felt if you were there? Okay. So Numbers chapter 13, one of the things that we have here um, is, um, mm, oh, you know, I put the wrong chapter 20. Why did I say chapter 13? Um because it's, I'm going to read verses 1 through 13. That's why. Chapter 20. Okay. So uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community. And the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into the wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. Okay, let's stop there. Let's put ourselves in that place. Here you have a desert experience. You're, you're in the desert. There's no water to drink. And Moses is going to uh, provide water out of this rock as he speaks to the rock. He's told to speak to the rock and the water out will come out of the rock and provide uh, what is needed for the people and for the livestock. So that's an experience, okay? And that's a, a mystical experience. Um, there would be nothing there that's a part of that situation where anyone would think, hey, if I say something to this rock, water's going to come out of it. So it's, it's kind of out there. It's kind of beyond their theological box, you might say. So notice what Moses does, verse 9. 
So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. And he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, uh, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock, uh, livestock drank. Okay, now stop there for a second. Oh, yay. He provided water out of the rock. Come on, get your animals and livestock. Get enough water for you and your kids. But notice then what happens in verse 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. You know what? Because he struck the rock and he didn't trust the experience that God told him to speak to the rock, it says, you're not going into the promised land, Moses. That seems a bit unfair to me, doesn't it? Because normally you would go, okay, hey, I don't know about this experience. God told me to speak to this rock and it's going to provide water. And for whatever reason, be out of his frustration with his community, the Israelites, or if he th he thought the only way water was going to come out is if somehow he punctures a hole into part of it. I don't know what his thinking was. But God says, no, 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 you didn't trust that mystical experience of what I told you in the tent of meeting. And so this is your consequence, okay? These experiences that are told all through the scripture would freak us out, don't you? That's the way I would feel. If I was there, I think I would have flipped out. I, what on earth is going on here? But they had already seen God provide uh, the separating of the waters uh, for the Exodus. They'd seen some other miracles, so maybe they were more used to some of these experiences than you or I might be. Another one, I won't have you turn to this one because I think you're familiar with it. Think about the early church. On the day of Pentecost, people from all over come into Jerusalem to celebrate the day of Pentecost, uh, the Feast of Pentecost, rather. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes down to rest upon the people and they begin speaking in tongues. And then other people begin to recognize their own language is being spoken by people who don't know how to speak that language. Another mystical experience. Rationally, intellectually, we would go, uh, this doesn't make any sense. How can people who don't know the language all of a sudden know how to speak in other earthly languages? Uh, but the mystical experience was, but there it is. That's what I experienced. That's what I see. Some thoughts there? So mysticism is something that can be a little bit frightening because we don't have control of it. And sometimes people will have experiences and other people won't believe them or people will feel afraid of sharing some of their experiences because they're going to look as though they're idiots or something by, by telling them this story of what they experienced. But think of this. I put together just kind of a short list because it's all the way from the beginning of Genesis all the way uh, through the Apostle Paul. Look at all these experiences. Abraham is told to go to a new land. Where are you going to go? I don't, uh, I, I will show you. Just leave your family and I'll, I'll show you the way to go. Jacob encounters a, a latter dream um, he wrestles with a man in the book of Genesis. He has a limp because of it. His name is changed. Moses encounters a burning bush. Uh, David, a lot of his experiences are found in the Psalms. Um, somehow he puts together his sense of God's um, movement in his life. When he writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and the rest of the 23rd Psalm. Mary encounters an angel, um, and you're going to give birth uh, to a boy, and you're going to name him Jesus. And 
uh, John writes this gospel where unlike the other gospels, he focuses a lot on the I am statements that Jesus makes, these very strange mystical type statements. I am the bread of life. What, what, what do you, I'm the door. What, what are you talking about? And then Paul, he alludes to an experience in second Corinthians 12, where it says he was caught up into heaven and he saw things uh, that he's unable to fully share or to explain. So what I'm saying here is there's a lot of these experiential type things that are found in the Bible. And the Bible's not just giving us, I guess, information about those experiences, but is giving us the hint that at times God operates outside of the mind and outside the text. And, and we feel that whether through a premonition or uh, a conviction or, you know, a sense of guilt about something or those type of things. Does all that make sense or have I lost you? Okay. So sometimes when I hear people say stories about things that they have experienced, um, you know, I have, I have my doubts. And when I do that, um, sometimes, uh, what, what I do is because I haven't experienced things like that, then they shouldn't either. Um, but I guess if we are willing to hear out where people are, what their story is, what their background is, is it really beyond God to at times work in ways differently than what he works within us who have maybe a whole different set of circumstances and experiences? So all I put on this slide was sometimes individual experiences can be dismissed because I my theological box or system um, prevents me from believing that that could possibly be right. So um, people who believe that all God had to say was finished with the scriptures will say, no, none of those things are valid because God closed the canon of scripture. And th that's kind of a theological safety net at times. Uh, because it's more about me being uncomfortable with certain things that other people say than whether that experience is genuine that they might have. So sometimes I have to go through deconstruction a little bit to understand that maybe God works in different communities in different ways than what he does within the community that I'm in. And, um, I think we hear that type of thing when we are when we are exposed to other cultures and other languages and things that go on in parts of the world that maybe we have never been to. Uh, and so it seems kind of irrational to us that some of these type of things happen. Um, the biggest issue in regard to that is usually healing. Um, I see goofballs like Ernest Angeli on TV, and it tends for me to say, that's not real. But then there's other situations where people really do have a healing uh, of some sort. And I know there's stories and testimonies out there where doctors at times ago, this doesn't make any sense. You had this illness and now you don't. Um, different things like that. I, I'm, I'm very suspect of people who say, oh, when I died on the table before me, before they brought me back, I saw whatever elements of heaven or the afterlife is. Well, I'm kind of, is that really true? Can that really happen? Who am I to say? I mean, I've never experienced that. So, 
you get where I'm coming from on, on that type of thing. All of that causes me to deconstruct what I think I have firmly nailed down sometimes. And um, so I don't know if any of you kind of had those same type of things, but uh, we, we do see that people have experiences uh, that we will call mystical for a lack of a better word. And, um, and I think some things maybe to keep in mind about this is when people have kind of these mystical type of experiences, is it, be, is, is it something that has happened to them that is a rarity or is this something that people say that garners a lot of attention because they desire that type of attention. So here's four things. Um, mystical experiences can't be controlled. Some people think about Paul on the Damascus Road, think about different things like that. Um, this is God that initiates it. Sometimes they are given as a gift. Uh, I think the angelic vision to Mary and Joseph is a gift to calm them down, to participate in the work God is calling them into bringing the Messiah into the world. Um, usually they're few and far between. Sometimes they can appear coincidental with other things. Um, but I like what Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And to do that is to keep an open heart and mind um, and to be receptive of what God might have us experience. Thoughts? Okay, so we've talked about that cycle, simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony. Walter Brueggemann, uh, Old Testament uh, scholar, puts it a different way. Sometimes we feel to totally oriented, then something happens and we are disoriented, and then we have to be reoriented uh, after that experience. Um, so that really does then lead to um, looking at the scriptures beyond the literalism that sometimes we feel most comfortable with. By literalism, I also mean kind of the text only has one single meaning and it only has that meaning. And if you don't agree with what I think that meaning is, then you must be wrong. That's a great way of kind of sucking the life out of the text as, as part of a sacred document that can speak to us in our moments. So I can read a psalm, and I might think it's a great psalm, but it's not a lifeline to me, where another person can read the same psalm, and it will get them through a difficult set of circumstances, because God is interacting with them through the text in a different way than maybe he has with me in that particular reference. So we need to move kind of beyond the literalism of, okay, this is what it meant, historically speaking. No, what does it also mean in, in our life as we are working through the issues of our life on a regular basis? And there's a lot of different, that can be thousands of different things that we experience in life. And as we do, maybe those are, some of those things are the way God really does touch us and and sustain us or give us uh, the type of strength that we need. Any thoughts there? Okay, so now this is where we're going to have a moment of where did he get that? Okay, so there's going to, I'm going to give you two examples. So I'm going to summarize the first one, and then we're going to look at the second one. I told you we'd come back uh, to the Numbers 20 episode, okay? I'll get to that in a second. So think about the Noah story for a moment. Uh, Genesis uh, chapter 6 through 9. Then 
the Noto story, it talks about a flood that wipes out the human race, except the family of Noah. There is this uh, new beginning, uh, this new um, uh, effort to get humanity on the right track. Um, it's funny to me, really, uh, about people that read that story, and then they debate about things about if if it could have been a worldwide flood or a local flood, as if that's the point of the story. The point of the story is human violence got so severe that God says they're going to destroy themselves. Uh, we're going to start over. Now, that's usually where we leave the Noah story. There's other additional applications, but in general, that's the way we think about it. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. I think in your notes it says 2 Peter. It's 1 Peter, though. 1 Peter chapter 3. So in Peter's epistle, he's talking about the episode of Noah. And if you come down to uh, verse, let's start at verse 17, that um, that kind of gives us the context. He's talking about suffering. And in verse 17, it says, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Terrific. God died, rose on our behalf for this. Now, after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Okay, who are they? Oh, well, he tells us something that about them in relationship to the days of Noah. Verse 20, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So evidently, whoever is being referred to here is related to a time period uh, of Noah and the building of the ark. Then it says, in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. And that's true. After that uh, rain subs uh, 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 subsides, they exit the ark and they start over. Now, here's where the twist comes. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. Boy, is that a hard right turn or what? Talking about Noah, talking about the uh, destruction, and then he introduces this concept of baptism. Where did that come from? I mean, we're not told in the text back in Genesis anything about this being kind of a figurative picture of baptism but that's the way peter takes it that's the way he applies the text that's the way he reconstructs the text ah. he deconstructs the historical meaning to give it also an additional meaning that it is related to his own context baptism is sort of like being in this moment where there's a whole new beginning that starts. After they exit the ark, there's this new beginning. And it says what it does. The removal of dirt from the body and the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. And then he reconnects it back to the resurrection. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. Okay, so... Peter deconstructs the Genesis text and reconstructs it in a way to apply it to his own day. That's my point of this illustration. Does that make sense? He has the liberty to take an episode that occurred in time and to bring it into his own day to see how that might apply in his own situation. Now, that, again, 
is something that causes us maybe some anxiety because what prevents people from doing doing anything with the text of the scripture but yet it's right before our eyes okay so now here's the one remember i said back in uh in numbers moses strikes the rock he's not allowed to go into the promised land water gushes from the rock okay now before i go back to that text i want us to think of, about something a mystical encounter is something that i think what we can say is uh, a window a painting and a mirror in other words um when we look at something the way it kind of reconstructs in our heart as we think about it is sometimes like a window we look back we look through we see the historical moment out of which this piece of art came that we call the scriptures sometimes it's a painting so like a good painting you look at it it's not just trying to capture a moment it artists are trying to get you to contemplate something deeper or it can be like a mirror that causes us to look back in our own life and reflect on it. So if we look at the text that has all three elements, window painting and mirror, then this quote, um, this comes from the latest podcast episode from um, uh, Faith for Normal People. So um, Pete Enns and Jared Bias are inter uh, interviewing this guy, Padraig Otuma, uh, he is an Irish um, uh, writer, and the subject matter of that latest podcast was a poetic look at the Bible. He says this, he says, in many ways, the danger of art is that it becomes propaganda in the hands of people who wish to use it for manipulative purposes. And what is absolutely true is that the Bible is art. Now, what he means by that is there are times when a piece of art can be misused rather than seeing it as a window or seeing it as a painting or seeing it as a mirror. Sometimes what it can be, it, it can be used as kind of like a, a weapon or a, a whip or something that can be imagined as a way of controlling people uh, because I've got the right interpretation and other people's experiences are somewhat discounted. All right. Now, this brings us to this episode. When you look at Numbers chapter 20 that we just read about, that is actually the back end, or you might say, the other bookend of a previous experience by this community in Exodus chapter 17. So they have the same problem. The problem is they're out where there's no water. So in Exodus 17, you can read this for yourself, Moses is told to strike the rock with his staff, okay? And out of it, water will pour. But in Numbers 20, he is told not to strike the rock, but only to speak to it. Well, he does it the way he's always done it, you might say. He strikes the rock, but this time the experience is, okay, you're not allowed to go into the promised land. Okay, now, the deeper question is this. Were those the only two times they got water was once on the front end and once on the back end in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20? What happened in between? So what's fascinating here is some of the ancient interpreters came up with the idea that there was this traveling rock that followed them or they carried through the wilderness that continued to provide water for them. So you see this uh, here, it's called the uh, Tosefta. So listen, listen to this. This is the Tosefta's version. 
which is rabbinical tradition on this idea of what happened between Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. And so the well, which was with the Israelites in the wilderness, was a rock. The size of a large round vessel, surging and gurgling upward, as from the mouth of its little flask, rising with them up unto the mountains, and going down with them into the valleys. Wherever the Israelites would encamp, it made camp with them on a high place, opposite the entry of the tent of meeting. The princes of Israel come and surround it with their staffs, and they sing a song concerning it. Spring up, O well, sing to it. The well which the princes dug, which the nobles of the people delve with the scepter and with their uh, staves, or slaves, rather. Um, and so here's this idea of the interpretation, at least one interpretation, of what happened. This was like a, a mobile drinking fountain that followed them all through the wilderness. Now, there's nothing in the text that says this, right? So they're superimposing or reconstructing what they think is happening. Okay, now this is going to blow your mind. You'll be thinking of this in your dreams. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So Paul now, he's aware of this tradition that there's this mobile drinking fountain that's following the Israelites all through the wilderness. And then notice what he says, beginning in verse one, it says here, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. And they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Okay. Well, all right, Paul, where on earth did you get that? Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So what's going on here? So you have the story, and then it is deconstructed and reconstructed several times over through these Jewish interpreters that begin to try to answer questions that the text doesn't address. And then they come up with their own version that this is kind of a mobile fountain that followed them through the wilderness. Then you have the discrepancy of speaking to the rock versus hitting the rock. And now, you know, what's interesting here is Paul says, oh, and you know who that rock was? Jesus. What? Maybe what Paul's trying to do is this, is he is trying to equate Christ with the rock as an example of how to update the scriptures to show that God was with them through the whole journey, and the God that was with them through the whole journey was Jesus. That doesn't mean Jesus was the actual rock. Are you following what I'm saying? That is kind of the metaphor, but it, the idea behind it is the, this is a way of looking at how God worked in the experiences of those that were in the wilderness. Well, what's the purpose of it? Take a look at verse six. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Oh, it's a lesson. It's an example. So you see here on the screen, Paul and other New Testament writers were part of these ancient interpreters um, that handled the scriptures in very creative ways. Um, and they take the original meaning, they reconstruct it in a way that's applicable to their situation. Now, here's the red flag that's going up in my mind. 
should be, I, I think that it's the same one that's probably going up in your mind. Well, you can make the scripture say anything you want then if you can't anchor it to one particular meaning. And there is some danger in that, isn't there? Um, and and so we begin to go, oh boy. So Paul's allowed to do that, but we're not. Okay, so that's kind of usually where the standard theological perspective is. Well, Paul's being moved by the Holy Spirit to do that, and he's allowed to do that, but we're post-canonical uh, scripture, we're not allowed to do that. So what we have to do is ignore all our experiences and all our questions and just take the the uh, face value of a, of a text. Well, I think what happens here is many times what we try to avoid in our experiences is simply that which we are afraid of, that which causes me uh, uneasy feelings. And um, so a couple of interesting passages, don't you think? So how does that forge our faith? Well, it's the fire of understanding that God takes the same text and sometimes will use it in ways in our own situation that is completely different than the original historical context. And when I say that to you, I'm biting my lip because everything within me wants to stick just to the historical context with that singular focus. But it seems as though if God's word continues to speak to us, it will speak in ways through our experience that will resonate with the circumstances that we are facing in the moment all right that's so that's what i have for us tonight what are your thoughts any any questions any concepts that you want to share no it's clearly complicated it's pretty complicated that's what i guess it is yeah, yeah. very complicated but it's there it's there in the text you see it with your own eyes, how this happens. And so the point is, even within the Bible, there is deconstructing and reconstructing of thoughts for the purpose of the author that's editing or writing the material in such a way that it will be profitable or for edification purposes or correction all those things that it tells us that the scriptures do. Um, and, you know, we have to be very careful with this, but the point is all of us go through these cycles at times and it's what changes how we perceive the world. And it's how we assimilate new discoveries um, that come into our experience all the time. So it's a challenge and very complex. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? No? All right. Well, we will stop here for tonight. And uh, I trust you have a good rest of the week. And we will see you all soon. Okay? Okay. Thanks, Thank Ryan. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.